Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. You can sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You'll also find our new t-shirts in the shop, including podcast shirts and quote shirts from your favorite classic novels. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic author to write their novels and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be continuing Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Chapter 2. Treasure Trove Marius had not left the Gorbeau house. He paid no attention to anyone there. At that epoch, to tell the truth, there were no other inhabitants in the house, except himself and those John Dretz whose rent he had once paid, without, moreover, ever having spoken to either father, mother, or daughters. The other lodgers had moved away or had died, or had been turned out in default of payment. One day during that winter, the sun had shown itself a little in the afternoon, but it was the 2nd of February, that ancient Candlemas day whose treacherous sun, the precursor of a six weeks cold spell, inspired Matthew Lainsberg with these two lines, which have with justice remained classic. Que Louise, oi que Lucerne, loi renta, duns in South Cavern. Marius had just emerged from his. Night was falling. It was the hour for his dinner, for he had been obliged to take to dining again. Alas, oh, infirmities of ideal passions. He had just crossed his threshold, where Mme. Bourgon was sleeping at the moment as she uttered this memorable monologue. What is there that is cheap now? Everything is dear. There is nothing in the world that is cheap except trouble. You can get that for nothing. The trouble of the world. Marius slowly ascended the boulevard towards the barrier in order to reach the Rue Saint-Jacques. He was walking along with a drooping head. All at once, he felt someone elbow him in the dusk. He wheeled round and saw two young girls clad in rags. The one, tall and slim. The other, a little shorter, who were passing rapidly, all out of breath, in terror, and with the appearance of fleeing. They had been coming to meet him, had not seen him, and had jostled him as they passed. Through the twilight, Marius could distinguish their livid faces, their wild heads, their disheveled hair, their hideous bonnets, their ragged petticoats, and their bare feet. They were talking as they ran. The taller said in a very low voice, The bobbies have come. They came near nabbing me at the half circle. The other answered, I saw them. I bolted, bolted, bolted. Through this repulsive slang, Marius understood that gendarmes or the police had come near apprehending these two children, and that the latter had escaped. They plunged among the trees of the boulevard behind him, and there created for a few minutes in the gloom a sort of vague white spot, then disappeared. Marius had halted for a moment. He was about to pursue his way when his eyes lighted on a little grayish package lying on the ground at his feet. He stooped and picked it up. It was a sort of envelope which appeared to contain papers. Good, he said to himself. Those unhappy girls dropped it. He retraced his steps. He called. He did not find them. He reflected that they must already be far away, put the package in his pocket, and went off to dine. On the way, he saw in an alley of the Rue Montfetard a child's coffin covered with a black cloth resting on three chairs and illuminated by a candle. The two girls of the twilight recurred to his mind. Poor mothers, he thought. There's one thing sadder than to see one's children die. It is to see them leading an evil life. Then those shadows, which had varied his melancholy, vanished from his thoughts, and he fell back once more into his habitual preoccupations. He fell to thinking once more of his six months of love and happiness in the open air, in the broad daylight beneath the beautiful trees of Luxembourg. How gloomy my life has become, he said to himself. Young girls are always appearing to me. Only formerly they were angels, and now they are ghouls. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today. 
while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Les Miserables. Don't forget you can sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. And while you're there, check out our t-shirt shop. You can look in the show notes or on our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show. We'd love to hear from you on social media. You can find us everywhere at Bite at a Time Books. time.